great to be here at the 3BL Forum. Thank you for having us. And I've, I've been listening all day, and a lot of people are talking about the last couple of years and what we've been through. And do you remember about a year and a half ago, there were a lot of conversations about, let's not go back to a broken normal. We were promising ourselves things were going to change. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we'll use this panel to, as a check-in. We'll see how we're doing. So we've been through a lot. Companies have made broad promises. They've told us that we're going to get a new employee value proposition. We went through a racial reckoning. We made big commitments across the board. So where are we today? We're looking at a, a, a huge transformation. We're still in COVID. We're still in, in a land, this land of uncertainty. But we know that we've, we've, we're in this now phase of layoffs and hiring freezes and quiet quitting and burnout. So we're going to talk today about what that looks like and what companies are doing. Are we really are we make, staying true to those promises we made each other? And so we've got a, a great panel here of three leaders from companies from different industries who bring a different call to action to this. And they're going to talk about their experience within their companies, both from that personal aspect, but also from within their companies. And the, the different call to action here are the power of networks and the practice of sustainability, which we've talked a lot about, and then content and storytelling. So let's dive into this. Um, let's start with just a little bit, we'll start quickly with just some of our, some of the, your background, the company you're with, the, the role you play at the company, and how is, how is each of your companies uniquely addressing the employee experience at this point in time? So Crystal, we'll start with you. Yep, I will start. So hello, everyone. It's always fun being in between you and cocktails. So wakey, wakey, <laughs> and pay attention. <laughs> um, I'm Crystal Barnes. Again, I'm at Paramount. All the brands that hopefully you love, from Nickelodeon to BET to MTV to Comedy Central to a bunch of other CBS. Um, and my role is the head of corporate social responsibility as well as ESG. And that, for a media company, is a unique space. For us, uh, right now, we're focusing a lot on, to your point, storytelling and the power of storytelling and how it's been a common thread in everything that we've all experienced over the past few months um, and years. And so our focus is really on the listen and do. It's not anything new. It's just actually doing it as a corporation. So listening to employees, what are you going to do? How are you going to take action? How are you going to take the programs that you already have and build on them? How are you going to dismantle some of the programs that are terrible that you need to redo to meet the needs of where we are as people and as society and as communities? So I can go into a lot of those details, but it's the good old listen and do, emphasis on the do, so that employees know that you're taking them through that exercise for a reason, that you're actually going to act on the things that you have asked them about. Thanks, you're up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophie Armanakian, head of sustainability for the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. I work for a basketball team, as well as a venue that hosts all of your favorite artists. Uh, we are the third busiest um, venue in the country. With that, we get to do a lot of cool events, and it's our responsibility to be really responsible. In that regard, uh, we take a lot of pride in being true to our community, and what we have been able to accomplish in the last two years has been quite remarkable for the city of Atlanta and our green bubble. Earlier this year, we were certified as the first and only venue in the world that operates zero waste. So we divert over 90% consistently from the landfill. Um, and that really takes place through the culture and the intent behind purpose, which is what we'll talk a little bit about today. Thank you. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Severia Harris, and I'm Vice President of Law for Patient Engagement and Customer Solutions. Since Crystal mentioned that Paramount is our favorite entertainment company, and Sophie, the uh, Atlanta Hawks is our, our favorite team. I must say Johnson & Johnson is obviously our favorite healthcare company. Uh, but it's an honor to be here today. Uh, in addition to my role as Vice President of Law, I've also served as the Corporate Chapter Chair for our Women's Leadership and Inclusion Employee Resource Group. And as part of that, had the honor of starting a new conversation series that was for women by women really during the darkest hours of the pandemic to allow for that storytelling by women at work. Um, it's been a pleasure to say that since the return to work, there's really been an ongoing focus on bringing in guest speakers um, to help facilitate new conversations at work. And I think that's important, and it's not because 
leaders uh, within the corporate environment aren't valuable and their stories aren't valuable, but sometimes there are things that your people will only open up about when they're hearing it from somebody else or someone else is facilitating or guiding the discussion. So um, that's been something that we've done not only for women but across the enterprise, and I think it's something really the company should take a look at is just getting another voice in the room to facilitate the conversation and hear those things that you might not have heard before. Thank you. So Crystal, I'll start with you and digging deep into, into the role you play at these companies. So I talked about the promises that companies have made to their workers. So talk a little bit about your role and how your company is making good on those promises, whether it's culture change or DEI or purpose. And then we mentioned the storytelling. Talk to, talk to me about how you bring your voice to that next generation. Yep, so um, on the culture change piece, again, with the listen and do, good old employee survey. You know, there are things that we had um, to reevaluate, whether it was going from three days in the office to two days in the office, being flexible around encouraging employees to commute outside of crazy commuting hours, specifically in New York City and LA, um, to, you know, no meeting days in the office. I mean, things that we quite frankly didn't do before. Um, that came up very loud and clear um, during our survey. So we had to actually listen to those things, implement them. 70% of an employee's experience is with their direct manager. So it's one thing to say it at the corporate highest levels of the organization. It's another thing if your manager gives you a hard time. And so we had to really make sure that that message permeated throughout the organization and that it was something that really was woven into our DNA. Um, so that's on the culture side. The uh, content side, we had to hold a really big mirror up to ourselves, specifically in 2020, post the murder of George Floyd, and recognizing that narratives, beliefs, biases, a lot of that exists within media. And we, along with many other media companies, have a role to play um, in trying to unpack and counteract some of those racist narratives and biases that exist within content. And so BET launched this initiative called Content for Change, which we later spread across the entire organization, which is to look at our content, our supply chain, our creative supply chain, and our culture, and make sure that we infuse the DEI principles that we have put forth to our own employees in the content that we create. That's a journey. Um, it requires looking at representation in your, our own content and holding our production folks accountable, our writing staff accountable, the folks, that, again, that we do business with who help us to create the content accountable, our own employees who touch the content accountable, but it's all about measurement, as we talk about often, mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that that information and data is in the right hands and that those folks are being held accountable. Their bonuses, their comp, how they're promoted in the organization, the stretch projects that they're given in the organization, all of that stuff has to connect. If it doesn't connect, you're doing it for nothing. And so we are working with our HR person, our head of diversity, myself, our head of legal. It's a part of every process that we have tried to put in place post that because time's ticking and we have a high expectation for ourselves and our content. And so it's insights based and driven, but it's about you know, really infusing humanity back into our organization in a way that's gonna create effective change. And the previous panel talked a lot about collaboration externally, but it sounds like it's a super collaboration within the organization as well, working with people you haven't worked with before because you can't solve it by yourself. Yeah, it's not an option, you have to, right. you have to. Right. And Ms. Ferry, I'll jump down over to you. So. Um, Women are often in positions that deal with culture within companies. And in fact, uh, there's a new McKinsey and Lean In study that shows that women are twice as likely to be involved in DEI jobs. And sometimes it's not something that was part of their day job, but they are, they are leaning into these types of positions. So, and you started to talk a little bit about the work that you were doing at J&J. &J. So, um, in, and we know these DEI jobs are big ones. Uh, CSP just released its Giving a Numbers survey and we saw that 85% of our companies say that their DEI investments are on the rise. So these are big jobs that, that, people, that our companies are working on. So talk to me about the importance of these contributions and the intersection um, with the business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know, there's not a company in this room or one that I can think of that says that DEI isn't a goal, right? It's like one of those things like innovation, um, which everybody says that they believe in, and then we have like the numbers that come out. Uh, there was a, um, there's a pastor who I once heard give a sermon and he said, 
if you want to know someone's values, look at their credit card statements. And um, I always thought that was sort of like a clever quip, but the point is, is you know, what we, what we all spend our money on every month says a lot about what our values are, our behavioral patterns, where we want to put our money and our time. And so I think that um, companies really have to start to get honest with themselves about whether or not they want to continue to say that they care about DEI, but not have numbers that live into that. And the reason is because the, the members of those groups, the women uh, who are now resigning even in record numbers from leadership, even still, um, people of color, they're looking. They're looking at the numbers. And it's almost worse, I think, to say that you care about DEI and not have really demonstrably measurable progress in it year over year um, than it is to simply take it off of your goals. Because at least that's honest. And then nobody has to hold you accountable. It doesn't have to be in any of these, these uh, you know, reviews and, and things like that. And so I guess you know, we're two years after George Floyd. We certainly have had a number of problems to deal with as a society beyond even George Floyd. But I think that there is an opportunity for companies to say, do we really care about this? And if we do, what is the two-year difference that we need to see not 20 year difference, um, which I really think is, is women and people of color can't wait. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that someone needs to speak up within the company and say, if, if, if no one else is gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Um, but to, to bake it in more that it, that has to happen. Yeah. Um, so Sophie, I love your story. Um, I'd love for you to tell people about how you came into your role, what, what job it was that you came into and how you helped shape it and make it what it is today. Absolutely. Um, so when I was recruited by the Atlanta Hawks, uh, I was recruited for a director of operations role to oversee four departments with the intent uh, to also do sustainability, which didn't exist prior to, at least not specifically. Um, in that role, my first two years, what we did was we restructured the org chart um, and we're very intentful with the responsibilities and really allocating the right resources and having that support from our ownership and leadership to allocate resources to be the innovators in this space. Um, with that, I then hired a sustainability manager. I have a zero waste squad. We do manual sorting on site. It's the only way to be able to divert 90%. Contamination is a global opportunity. And then uh, a couple of months ago, I was promoted to head of sustainability. W and we've since then created an entire department, even when we look at our budget and our budgetary codes, allocated specifically to sustainability and no longer just being a part of operations and sustainability. And continuing to look at how we can innovate this 2.0 version of what we've done. You know, Crystal talked about DEI, and you mentioned two versus 20 year targets and goals. And those things are so important. You know, what we've accomplished holistically and now the focus on sustainability would not be possible if it wasn't including every stakeholder in our organization. Making sure everybody understands what our vision is, what is our goal, and what is the role that they play in. You know, you said you want to know my, about my values, you look at my statement. That same thing applies to when you look at our supply chain and what we're spending money on. Are we intentful with what's coming into our building? Um, and so being able to be an advocate to push and do things that haven't existed has been part of my story um, because there was no head of sustainability th in the NBA until now. There was no specific role in this person. My entire team, everyone is a new person within their role, my entire squad, and I'm so happy to be able to influence the infrastructure and see more and more roles within our industries that are specific to sustainability. That's great. So um, I think we're, you know, you're all women when, within these roles. Um, you, you're, all, you're all in roles that are focused on culture and culture change and, and using the power of networks and, and the power of sustainability and the power of, of voice. So what, if you can leave the audience with one takeaway of, you know, again, what is that superpower within your company that is the, the one unique thing your company can do? And then, and then those, the personal aspect you bring to this job. It's not just the company. It's not just the community. It's, it's you, you bring your authentic self to work 
Um, what's, what's one key takeaway you can, you can share with our audience? You want me to go first? Okay. Yeah, you, go first. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is not profound, <laughs> um, but you have to go through to come through, right? Like we had to go through what we're going through in order to come out on the other side. And the, the value of partnership and collaboration at companies, I feel like, is stronger than it has ever been now. Um, consumers and employees are gonna hold your feet to the fire a lot more than they have in the past, but that's a good thing. And so, you know, one of the things that we know as I feel like practitioners in this space, to your point, is that people are looking to move to a place, and someone said it on the previous panel, they're not, young people, I feel old every time I say young people, mm -hmm. they are not going to come and work for an organization that they don't believe in the values and the morals and the outputs of what they do deliver or produce, period. And so, you have a short window of time to show that employee from the moment that they show up to the moment they sit at their desk, be it in person or virtual, to show and prove what you have said that you would do for them as an employee, or as I like to say, as a member of their organization. So the window is short. And as companies, we have to figure out how to figure out what that, su what that superpower is. What is that special sauce? We don't need to boil the ocean. Figure out, stay in your lane. Figure out what you do as an organization great and double and triple down on that. And every employee should have a seat at determining what the outcomes of that is going to be because it gives you pride in the organization that you're a member of. So I guess my thing is it's, it's everyone's job, DE&I and CSR and social impact and sustainability and ESG, they don't exist just in one department or division at an organization. It is all of our responsibility to help each individual to figure out what their voice is in that journey. It's a shared journey, we're on it together, but if we do it together, we'll win. Thank you. So I have a question for the audience by a show of hands. Who's been to a live sporting event or a concert? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like about everybody. And we're all part of the solution. So I think everything that we do matters and understanding that Perfection cannot get in the way of making progress, and we know that we can't be sustainable without innovation, so being comfortable to do things you've never done before, to really push the envelope. We're not going to get different results doing the same thing over and over again. So my ask would be simplify it, make it accessible, um, and get everybody on board because there's that purpose of being a part of something to drive a solution. and. Culturally, the way I have seen our organization shift, I mean, the employees, you're talking about your frontline individuals who care. Everyone's doing their part. I get pictures sent to me from various departments. Earlier, I got a phone call from our VP of guest experience because they were getting rid of some stuff, and they were like, what should we do with it? And they're more intentful. They're, they, they understand the impact it has holistically over our entire organization. So be inclusive, allow people to be a part of what the goals are, and um, don't be discouraged if it's not working out, because it's not easy. Yeah, I, both great remarks. I guess what I would say is, with the pandemic, as we all know, the, li the lines between home and work got really, really blurred in some good ways and in some not so good ways. But I think coming out of it, employees are really, the workforce that you have wants to be seen more holistically. And that's a good thing because I think that when things get too transactional, when it's just about do the job, get the check, get the benefits, that's when you have these re great resignations. That's when you have people leaving because if the relationship is purely transactional, then it's just about who can give me the next best transaction. But if the company is showing up in a way that is supporting my goals, supporting my development, supporting me holistically and my interests outside of what I can do for them, that, I think, engenders the new brand loyalty. That engenders the new sense of, I'm doing things at this company that I couldn't do anywhere else. And I think that's really the frontier that for companies that are gonna say, we're moving beyond the transaction and, and we're taking a more evolved look at how we invest in our talent, those are gonna be the companies that win. Absolutely, yeah, and I think just to, to wrap up, that it's really understanding that employees gained a lot of power during COVID because employers knew employees are the number one stakeholder, we have to take care of them. If we do that well, the, the rest will work itself out. And 
and if we're going into this, uh, you know, this uncertain time with the possible recession, that companies might feel like they can, they need to retreat. But it, we we know that they have to double down on this. They have to, you know, what we really want here is to. There are a lot of innovations that were found during COVID. We don't want to forget those things. There were so many lessons learned. You know, we talked about the silver linings to this this COVID cloud, and to to really just use this as as we're doing with this panel as a time to reflect and say, what are these things that worked? What are the things that we did well? You know, whether it was recognition or just listening or or taking care of people and finding new ways to to refashion this employee value proposition, but to to again to to step back and say we can we can't retreat. We have to really do this and. And we have to support our people, and it can't just be these volunteer jobs that people step up for. This has to be baked into the culture and really change the, the idea of this. It's not just retaining talent, it's retaining the human nature of, of what a company stands for. So thank you so much to our panel. It, it, I think you, you both, you, the three of you, bring just such a great um, insight into how companies can approach the, the next whatever we face. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.